to the Accounting Society at slash Ben Appleside. It's very good to see you all, all here again. If you um, if you keep a few housekeeping notes before we start, um, you guys should have gotten an email from Sandra, our upcoming president, about signing up for the NJSCPA, which is the New Jersey Society of Certified Public Accountants. Please do so. It is a it is an organization that helps out a lot in the CPA exam, they provide you with a lot of benefits towards getting your CPA license, connecting you with many accounting firms. I'm a student member myself. Lena, our president, is also a member as, member as well. So yeah, I would encourage you all to please sign, please sign up. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Sandra, myself, or, Le or Lena. Um, second, ask can we know? FBAP applications, they are due today. So if you so if you, so if you have applications to turn in, please go back to Professor Bazinkai and we'll get that straightened out straightened out for you. Otherwise otherwise I would like to pass it up pass it up to I'm Jesse Jesse Stu from Cone Resident. So let's pass it off to Jesse to uh, from Cone Resident. Alright. Thanks everybody. Um, I am Jesse Stoop, I'm a CPA for Cone Resnick, I'm an FDU alum, from the class of 06, so it's kind of cool to be back. Uh, this nice building wasn't here when I was here, it was the upstairs only, and it was just the library, so it's kind of cool seeing new things and different things. So, first half of the presentation is really just like some basic information and background on Cone Resnick, what the firm is, who we are, what we do. Um, the next half of the presentation is kind of going to take you through life of, as an auditor, I sit on the audit side, I'm an audit senior manager, so. Um, I know enough tax to be dangerous, but I'm uh, not an expert in that imagine, in that department. I let the evil tax empire uh, take over when it comes to that kind of stuff. Cool fact, I have a twin brother who is also a CPA, who is also a graduate from here, that works for Eisner Amper. So <laughs> I just like to compete against my brother in every facet of imagination. So, uh, so, but I'd like to make this as interactive as possible, so as you guys go through this, if you see something on here you want to ask questions about, um, it's much better if we interact and talk to each other than, you know, me just talking the whole time. I'd rather get your questions and see what I can, you know, provide insight to and hopefully help you out with in any, any way I can. So, all right. All right. Cone Resnick's mission is to provide forward-thinking solutions, service that exceeds expectations, and create opportunity, value, and trust for our clients, our people, and our communities. We are Cone Resnick. So, Basically, we never want to be behind eight ball. We always want to be forward trendsetters. Um, it's much better to service our clients if we're ahead of the game than behind. So if you know a new accounting for that's coming out or you have no of a new change in a tax law or a new auditing standard that's going to require additional work or a change from like, okay, we've always done it this way, but we can't do it that way anymore because of A, B, and C. We want to have that communication up front because it's much easier to explain things up front than to try to like, at the end of the day, go back and be like, oh, well, we couldn't just do it that way because A, B, and C. If we have information out to our clients and our, uh, you know, our employees and anybody else that we're working with ahead of the game, it just makes the whole process easier. So it's much better to kind of know the whole story ahead of the game than behind. I'm sure you guys would feel the same way. All right. Our vision is that we will be a firm of excellence and innovation providing invaluable services and insights to our clients, fostering a workplace culture that develops leaders and values diversity, and working to make our communities better. Um, the firm, which I'll get into in a little bit, is kind of a unique mix because it's a very large firm, but it's actually a conglomerate of a bunch of smaller mom and pop firms that kind of got merged in and kind of created a kind of a small, small feel, but a big environment. So uh, each office is pretty unique that they have different initiatives and different local community outreach and programs that we do. You know, whether it's a social committee or a volunteer committee in each office, and they might do something different in each office. Uh, I work out of our Eaton Town office down near the shore, you know, so we do a lot of things around the Asbury Park area and certain other things and certain shelters and things like that. And Roseland, you know, maybe they're going to an animal shelter or Bethesda, they're doing something here or they're going there. So it's kind of big, but it's all, at, at the end of the day, we try to make each community involvement important and what's important to the people and the, and the employees that work in those respective offices. So our values are driven. This is on pretty much every wall uh, and main conference room across the firm's office. 
we call it our pyramid values. So these are values that all employees are strive to live by every day. So a passion for excellence, yearning for knowledge, respect for others, adaptability and flexibility, making difference, integrity, reliability and trust, and developing opportunities. Spells pyramid. So um, each office gives out specific awards to certain employees if they go above and beyond and certain things of you know, if you're earning for knowledge, if you took on this new engagement that required like this complex research and all of a sudden you had to, you never do, had seen it before or done it before, and you owned it and you went and you did the research and came up with the answers to provide the right conclusion, you know, you could get a, an award as an employee from your partners in your office that say, you know, you really went above and beyond here, we want to respect you for that. So, at various times of the year, they get spot awards out for these various categories if you did something above and beyond. And at the end of each, at the end of each year, normally in December, you know, each office does a annual kind of state of the firm, state of the office meeting that talks about, you know, office results, what things are looking like, what things have been like, you know, what their trends going forward, whether we have new work coming in, new work going out, you know, and, and overall winners will get allocated each year too. So, you know, we really respect the people that work for it for us. Um, I couldn't do my job without the people below me and the people above me. So if you, you know, if you have to see somebody really doing uh, going above and beyond, you try to get them the recognition they deserve. The breakthrough symbol. So this is pretty much on every advertisement, business card, logo, um, every letterhead that we have. So basically, it's supposed to be designation forward thinking. Um, you know, we're breaking through the circle. Um, that's the mindset of it. So. It's a marketing genius. I'm not a marketing major, but uh, you know, it's uh, it's different. So, you know, it's, but it is on everything that we do, and everything that's how we kind of brand ourselves. So we're trying to be forward thinking, and we stand with integrity, commitment, and drive. So once again, we're trying to be ahead of the game, not be behind. So if we can service our clients right by having open communication throughout the year, not just once a year, you know, we can know if like they have something in mind, like I'm going to do an acquisition, or I'm going to sell a piece of this business, or you know, I think I'm starting up a brand new business. If we have this communication, this knowledge throughout the year versus once a year, A, we're servicing our clients better, but B, it just lets us come up with different strategies and techniques that we say, okay, if you want to do that, that's great, but make sure you consider A, B, and C, because you know, if you go down the wrong path, you might get yourself in trouble. So we don't want to tell people they're in trouble if we didn't communicate up front that they didn't think about these things, because sometimes people don't think about these things. Sometimes people just go, this is what I'm going to do. So. Try to make, try to make it as easy as possible as, as much as we can. Frank Long Lombardi, he's our CEO. He was uh, assumed the role of CEO in 2015. He's based in our New York City headquarters. Uh, he is an avid Yankees fan, so I'm sure he's watching the game tonight. He serves as the treasurer of the Arthritis Foundation. He's dedicated to be accessible and open door. Um, every day, every Tuesday, we get an email that comes from Frank called Breaking Through. Um, and it kind of goes through different firm initiatives and different things that are in the hopper and what's going on. So it talks about, you know, new, new strategic service plans, new client service plans. If we have, um, there's a summary of new work that we're bidding on, new work that we want. If there's something like big going on, obviously with the hurricanes that just happened in Texas and Florida. Um, one of the things our government practices group does and has a specialty in is Kind of doing specialty advisory work where you know if you're submitting a claim because you had hurricane damage you know uh, we have people that are experts in that so we actually have a team of about 30 people in texas now going through claims of people who are processing insurance money and getting the government the funds from fema to the employees or the into the customers or into the homeowners or business owners hands so they can start the rebuilding process so that kind of stuff comes out in our breaking through email that we get Anybody have any questions so far? <coughs> All right, Cohen by the numbers. We're technically the 11th largest accounting firm in the, in the U.S. Uh, we have approximately 2,400 employees, approximately 300 partners. Uh, we were founded in 1919. We are in about 29 cities, and we're just over 600 million in revenue. So, um, next I'll kind of go through this, but. We're basically on the East Coast, we go from Boston to Atlanta, and then we have a couple things in the middle. We have some operations in Texas, Chicago, 
a lot of stuff in California. We have some international operations in India, Toronto. There's a PO box in the Cayman Islands somewhere that I'm dying to see if they would ever see me, send me there. Um, but I don't think that's happening. But uh, you know, we're kind of like what I said before. We're, we're, it's interesting that we're big, but we're small. So each office is kind of unique. So not every office does the exact same client service in different industries. So um, out of my office, the two largest things and that we pro our client base is is manufacturing distribution and construction clients. Um, you know, and Roseland is different, and York City is different, and Beth Bethesda is different, and Georgia is different. So each one is kind of big. Uh, we have some national practices, which I'll get into in a couple minutes. But so if you have a specific interest, just because you're a specific local office that you might be working in, doesn't necessarily do that work. It's not that you can't get access to try to do something else. So if you have a really interest in hospitality clients or entertainment or um, private equity or Real estate or anything, uh, renewable energy, all these different things, nonprofit. You know, the firm has all this stuff that we do. You just have to communicate. Like, if you're really interested in doing something, speak up because, like, if you're interested in a specific industry or a specific segment, you're probably gonna do a better job <coughs> if you're interested in that. Versus, like, if I put you on like a construction client and you hate construction, you're probably not gonna do as good a job. So, we'd much rather have our employees happy and involved than doing something they hate every day. Sometimes you get, sometimes you get on a client or in a situation where it's like, you just got to do it for a while. But if like, you know, at the end of the day, like this is not what you want to do. Like we don't want to put you in a hole where it's like this is what you're gonna do already because then you're just gonna leave. So we want to try to get our employees involved and take their ownership and their involvement on in their specific client engagements and industries that they serve. We have international outreach. We're a member. We're actually a founding board member of Nexia International. So uh, we do have some international locations independently, but other parts of the world where we don't have an office, we use our Nexia affiliates. So Nexia is essentially a group of accounting organizations that, you know, I don't, our office doesn't have a office in, or our Cohen resident does not have an office in Israel. One of my clients has operations in Israel. So when we're doing the year-end audit for that client, we work through Nexia International, and we actually pair up with BDO Israel and BDO does some work for us where we can help each other out and vice versa. So if you have a company, you know, that's uh, the accounting firm's headquartered in London or in Africa or Great Britain or Paris or wherever, or South America, you know, and one of their clients is doing work in the US, you know, they reach out to us where we can do some work for them. So it kind of shares it up. So here's the geographic coverage that I was talking about. Um, Back in 2012, the Cohen-Resnick merger happened. It used to be J.H. Cohen and Resnick Group. Um, back, back in 2012 when the merger happened, we became Cohen-Resnick. So uh, the legacy J.H. Cohen offices are based in the Northeast and California. And the le legacy Resnick offices are basically Baltimore, Bethesda, South, Texas, and Chicago. Um, and they did have operations in California. So uh, the Resnick Group was primarily a very large real estate and affordable housing practice, and they had no operations in New York City, which is, happens to be one of the biggest real estate markets in the world. Uh, shocker, right? Um, so, and they had specialties in renewable energy and certain other things that, you know, J.H. Cohen did not have. So the mergers really, it was a merger, and it kind of expanded our offerings. Really, no. The only cities that had any geographical overlap was Los Angeles, and it happened to be that the lease for J.H. Cohen's office in LA was up basically at the time of the merger, so those employees moved right into the resident group's offices. So it kind of did work out, because um, we were doing certain client work with, if I had, a, I had a client put in solar panels on their facility, and we really didn't have a renewable energy practice but the resident group does now. So we had to kind of outsource to make sure they were getting the right service to a third party. But now with this merger and the expanded offering of services and capabilities, we all keep it on one house so that we can kind of manage that relationship better. Sometimes when you outsource work to a third party vendor or supplier or somebody else, it could mitigate that relationship if they don't do, you know, you recommend somebody, you really don't know them, and then they do a crappy job and then you look bad. So uh, this expanded offerings and kind of national approach of coming at things really helps us out. 
industry experience. So this is kind of some of the stuff I was talking about. Our national practices are a lot related to real estate, affordable housing, commercial real estate. We're actually the largest real estate firm in the country. Um, private equity and venture capital and renewable energy. So every office uh, kind of service these types of clients. And then we have select city, city practices. So construction, hospitality, M&D, manufacturing distribution, not-for-profit technology. You know, not every office does this. You know, there's certain nuances to construction accounting or manufacturing distribution or not-for-profit. So if the firm doesn't have, if that specific office doesn't have an expertise in that, uh, you know, risk and the firm management doesn't want them just going off and doing something they don't really know how to service. So the goal is that every office eventually has all the expertise, but you know, it's, it takes a couple years just to get training on board and get people relocated to, you know, maybe you don't service, you know, hospitality clients in Texas because there's not a really huge hospitality market there. You know, so you wouldn't just open a segment of your business up and try to land business if there's no business to be landed. So you want to kind of manage that process. So, and there's local practices, financial services, government, healthcare, law firms, retail and consumer products. So there's hundreds of things to do. You know, the good thing about accounting is that A, the accountants are always needed, and B, we change the rules every year. So it's like the greatest <laughs> job security act ever. So what was okay last year is not okay this year because you know this rule changed. So it kind of makes it fresh and interesting because what was okay is no longer okay. So you're always learning something new, and uh, you know if you start to dabble in different industries, you might say, you know, I really thought I was going to like not for profit, but I really like law firms or I really like renewable energy. So you, you might go into things thinking I might like one thing, but find out you know I really have a passion for something else. So it gives you an opportunity to kind of pursue different avenues and see different things. You know, we try not to, uh, when you first start out, we try to make sure that you get a little bit of experience in a lot of things. We don't want to just throw you onto just one industry or one segment of clients, because if you don't really like that, then you don't get an opportunity to try different things or see different things. So we want you to kind of dabble, you know, take a couple years and figure out what you kind of do like. And then after like two or three years, you kind of get a feeling of like what you do like or are interested in. So uh, it could be, you know, you started with one thing, but end up with something completely different. Anybody has questions, please raise your hand or shout it out. Uh, this is a listing of some of like our premier clients or clients that we currently do work for. Um, so there's some big names that are on there and there's plenty of smaller names or more uh, family owned enterprises that aren't on this list, but some of the bigger names, you know, kind of listed here. The firm takes great pride that we are the auditor of the AICPA. Um, it really is a flagship account for us. We really take pride in that. So um, it's a good thing that when you, know, you audit the trendsetters of the accounting world, it's, uh, it does speak loudly for our firm. So services. So most, most public accounting firms are broken down into a couple tranches. So accounting and insurance, tax and advisory, advisory consulting, and then we have affiliated companies. So, you know, accounting and insurance is where I sit. So I focus on clients that need audits, compilations, reviews, SEC engagements with 10Qs, 10Ks. Um, you know, tax does your compliance work with you know, your tax returns. They do tax consulting, R&D tax credits, SALT engagement, state and local, uh, payroll taxes, R&D tax credits, planning, Advisory is kind of interesting because it could be advisory is a bunch of basic. You think of yourself as like consultants and some of the cool stuff you can do in advisory. Um, one of the coolest practices that I got to help out when I first started out is our forensics and due diligence. So if you have like fraud or something going on or bankruptcy, you know, there's different things that you can do. Um, so we have kind of a gambit of things where we try to service our clients through. Ideally, we're touching our clients in all these capacities uh, and assisting them in everything. If you're only doing an audit, if you're only doing a tax return, you're not really getting to know that client relationship and building it up as much as you possibly could be. Um, now, if a client only needs an audit because they have people in-house to do a tax return, you're not going to say, I'm not going to do your audit because you won't let me do your tax return. Like, that's not how it works. But, you know, generally, if we have more touches into our clients and are assisting them in greater things, A, it makes the firm more profitable, but B, we have a better relationship with
imagine more. Why Cone Resnick? All right, so the benefits of a national firm. Um, education and training, firm-wide training ladders. So what's kind of cool is when you first start, if you were to start a Cone Resnick or a, a larger regional firm or a larger national firm, um, at least at Cone Resnick, you all come together. So if you're hired in New York or New Jersey or Connecticut or Boston or California or Texas, when you first get hired, we bring you all together. So you come in as like one big class. So you get to kind of like develop a relationship with people, not just like with the people in your office that you're gonna be working with the most, but like if you hit it off, if you sit with somebody from California and you know, you, you can talk to them throughout the year and like, you know, I'm doing this, what are you doing? Um, and then on an annual basis, we have different training ladders. So if, when you first get started, you're at an entry level, then you're promoted to staff one or staff two or senior or manager. You all come together again at different times throughout your career, and you get to see each other again. So it's kind of cool that you get to interact with different people at different times. Um, career advancement, you have an opportunity to start as an intern and get promoted all the way up to partner. One of the partners out of the Rosen office that I worked, I have worked for in the past did that. He started with the firm back when it was J.H. Cohen as an intern, and now he's, uh, he's an insurance partner. So uh, career advancement can occur, it does occur. Cl client base and travel opportunities, so I have clients that have operations not just, most of my clients are in, in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, so that's where they spend most of my time. But I do have clients in, with operations in Texas and California, I used to have somebody that was in operations in Seattle, so you do get a chance to travel if you want. Um, we don't travel a lot necessarily, certain accounts you travel more for, um, but you're not, what's nice is you travel, I feel like I get to travel enough where it's like I get to go see and do different things, but I feel like I'm not living out a suitcase every day of my life. So. It's kind of a happy medium. I have two young kids now and a wife. She doesn't want me on the road all the time either, so, and I'd like to see my kids. So it's kind of a good thing. You know, you get a chance to go out and see different things and do different things, but you are working kind of in your region most of the time. So um, kind of one of the things I talked about was like, if we were trying to expand our service offerings, like um, let's say we have an office in Charlotte. Um, they have not historically had a construction industry practice group out of Charlotte. Uh, it's something the firm's trying to grow. So one of our, one of the managers, the senior managers from our White Plains office relocated to Charlotte and is helping grow the construction industry practice there and training the employees down there into, into the world of construction accounting, you know, what to look out for, what to do, what to not do. Um, so if you have an opportunity and the knowledge and you're willing to relocate, they will relocate you if it's something that may, kind of makes sense. Um, and it's just an opportunity that gets you to see different things and do different things. Resources, we have a national a and a national tax group, so you never have to feel like you have to have the answer. Um, you know, there's a bunch of people smarter than I am that sit in the ivory tower at national <laughs> that know a lot more than I do. So I try to do as much research as I can, I present my findings, and I'll put together my analysis of this is what I think it is, you know, client presenting with this situation, this is my research, my conclusion is that it's this, and this is the answer. You know, I'm not gonna be the final send all be all. I wanna reach out to somebody above me that's above my pay grade that will have, maybe I've seen this before, and get their conclusion to make sure I didn't consider something, or I considered something too much or not enough for vice versa. So you get an opportunity to interact with people um, across the firm. So, you know, these people have a lot of years of experience and different knowledge, so chances are they've probably seen something or heard something at some point. So you don't have to feel like you have to have the answer where it's like it's all falling on you. Because it's never gonna all fall on you. So we do have various technical experts. Um, part of the thing with the advisory group is, you know, um, some of the stuff is what they do with bankruptcy or you know, fraud or even divorce cases, you know, if you need a technical expert, we'll testify in court through our advisory group on certain situations, certain things. Um, and variety of service and industries, so you get a chance to specialize. So like I said, if you really like a certain industry, but you don't have enough work in necessarily that in that specific office, you have an opportunity where you, you know, depending on workload and balance, you could transfer. We have had people move, you know, they started in Eatontown where I am, and they wanted to live in the city. So people aren't gonna necessarily commute from Eatontown to the city every day if they don't have to, especially when we have a very nice brand new building in Midtown Manhattan. So, um, you know, they got the opportunity to transfer and then they still work on certain clients that they used to work on, but they largely relocate in and take on different responsibilities. So there's different things to get a chance to do 
and see throughout the year and throughout your years and your career. All right, strategic initiatives. So, like I said, we have a very large diversity and inclusion uh, focus at the firm. Um, two things that are that really start out: women can and executive women's forum, uh, women-based initiatives. Um, so, empowerment of women and involvement of women in all facets of business. You know, it used to be before I started. You know, the uh, the adage was like women couldn't make partner. Because eventually, if they got married, they had kids. They wanted they had to stay home, and take care of their kids. That's not the case anymore. Um, my office managing partner is a female. She's the most powerful person in our office by far. Um, you know, there's different initiatives and different things they do. Executive Women's Forum. Um, they do different things. Uh, they host an annual golf tournament, and lessons. They do different strategic initiatives and planning with different other female nonprofit organizations. Uh, diversity and inclu exclusion. An executive council, like if we try to make sure like each office isn't all the same. Even if you think about it, like everybody here is an FDU student. You know, if everybody from FDU went to the same exact employer and worked at the same exact firm all the time, everybody would kind of end up thinking the same way because you all were involved at some point. You kind of your starting point from college and learning of accounting was, you know, FDU gave me this knowledge and this is what I'm going to try to do and this is what I think makes most sense. So if you get to interact with even different universities and schools, you have different mindsets of how different things can work. So, you know, we do have a very large focus on diversity and inclusion, and we want to make sure that we're not excluding anything and not overthinking anything either, but kind of make sure we have that happy medium. You know, we're not going out of our way to say, you know, it's not like there's quotas or anything, but we're trying to make sure it makes sense. Where you, if you have clients that in certain industries that you know, if we have a client that um, has, they're headquartered in Mexico, you know, if you have somebody that has the ability to speak Spanish, that's a big deal. You know, and so we do like to have the inclusion of all thought facets and, and opportunities that can help service our clients. At the end of the day, if we can service our clients, that's our number one goal. And by having different diversity and inclusion local action committees do things, uh, you know, it just helps us out in the long run. We have various um, national giving back programs, um, so charity involvement. If you have specific charities or foundations that you like to participate in, you have the opportunity to take a day and go help that organization take the day off of work or whatever and go do something or get a community, get a group of you to go do it. Uh, my next paycheck, which will happen on Friday, I'm getting my $25 annual, they give me $25 annual a year from the firm, and uh, the only ask is that I donate it to a charity of my choice. So it doesn't have to be ch a choice of the firm, uh, national pro programs that they use, but take that $25, don't put it for me, it's not my money. You know, give it to, whether it's my local church, or if I want to give it to hurricane efforts, or I want to give it to, you know, the, um, you know, an animal shelter, or whatever I want to do. You know, they, they hope you don't keep it. They can't tell that you do or you don't, but they do give you $25 once a year, every year, to take that money and try to give it to some kind of philanthropic organization. Um, Cone Resnick Foundation is a national charity, so Make-A-Wish, Special Operations Warrior Foundation, Joe Torrey Safe at Home Foundation, and the Orphan Relief Effort. Uh, those are national charities that the firm promotes. Um, you know, Make-A-Wish, we've done, since I've started, I think it's like 20 something years now, uh, we've done a bowl-a-thon right there off Route 10 at Hanover Lanes. Um, we do a bowl -thon once a year for July for Make-A-Wish. And we're, Cone Resnick is the largest corporate donor for New Jersey Make-A-Wish um, in Make -A -Wish, New Jersey Make-A-Wish uh, history. So every year a Wish family or two gets to come and talk and talk about like, you know, what the money that was raised was for. I think we've raised over like $2 million in its inception. So um, Joe Torrey Safe at Home, uh, when it was Legacy, J.H. Cohen, uh, Joe Torrey was the spokesperson for J.H. Uh, Cohen, and it was worked out well because it was, he was still with the Yankees at the time, and we didn't have, we were in the city, but nobody really knew us, so they went out and got Joe Torrey to make the name known, and then as soon as uh, he left the Yankees, he moved to L.A., went to the Dodgers, and we opened an office in L.A., so it kind of worked out. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but 
Um, so we are very involved with the Joe Torrey Save at Home Foundation. Uh, there's an annual golf outing, and Joe Torrey shows up every year for it. Um, get people to go show up, get it, take their picture, get an autograph or two, support his foundation and his relief efforts and, and the programs that he does. Um, local office programs, you know, every office does something different. You know, we have a we have a social committee and we have a community outreach committee. So if somebody has a specific foundation or something they're interested in, and they bring it to those local committees and those offices, and they put together events and fundraisers and activities to kind of go after what each local office wants to do. So it kind of it's kind of cool because it gives you an opportunity. You know, when Sandy hit, we did a rebuild thing with uh, with Habitat for Humanity. So we got to go. And we, paint a house, one, one group painted some houses, and the other group was like, you know, helping clear out rub rubble and rubbish from all these damaged homes. So it was kind of, it was kind of cool to be involved and do different things. So, all right. That's some kind of high level information on the firm. I don't know if anybody has any questions or wants to ask anything. When you say that um, entry level all gets hired together within every single office, is there a certain spot that you guys choose every year? Like how do you do that for Not everybody gets hired exactly at the same time. So each office could be like if you have a demand where you, you need some additional younger staff to start earlier, they will. Um, it's dependent on each office's needs. But generally our our entry levels start in November mm -hmm. and then we start training right away. They, you come in, you start training for like a week or two, come to your local office for a couple of days of interaction, meet and greet with the people that you work with, and then we try to get in the field as, as fast as possible. We really feel, we'll get into it, but we feel like you get the most training and experience from hands-on experience versus like sitting in a, in a classroom and trying to go through like case studies or examples. I mean, you do learn stuff that way, but if we can get you in front of clients and interacting with different team members, we think you, you learn more that way. Um, I interned at the Roseland office, so I'm just curious to see if at Eatontown, like mm -hmm. the audit and the tax practices are kind of separated like they are in Roseland. Well, Roseland's on two floors, so yeah. it's Eaton Town's all on one floor. So, um, I mean, there is like the tax side of the building, and then there's the audit side of the building. But we do interact with each other. So, um, you know, if I have a, if I client with a tax question that I'm, I know enough to be dangerous. I'll admit I know enough to hang myself, but I don't know. I'm not an expert in it. So, if I really need, if it gets into something like specific, I'm going to go to my tax department and the manager, the senior, or whoever's on the account that I'm working on, and like a client reach out to me. I take like the annual tax training every year because regardless, people know I'm an auditor. I always get, what's new with tax? And it's like, <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah. So I take, I do take the tax training every year. Just kinda, I want to know the concepts of what's changing, but I don't know necessarily the specifics. So I like to leave, or get our evil, I like, we joke in audit and tax. We call each call each other the evil empire, um, <laughs> at least in our office we do. You know. For us, as an auditor, tax is evil empire. And for tax, audit's evil empire. You know, we blame each other for certain things, just joking around. But um, so it just really depends. We try to, and in the perfect situation, we're on a key, cohesive unit. So on our audits, what we try to do is we try to involve tax in all our planning meetings. So like before we start work, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're going to do the 2017 audit of ABC Company. So it's not going to be all just audit people sitting in the room. It's like we want to get tax involved so that if tax says, you know, this rule change, so if they did this, we need to know about it. Because if we can tell, figure that out earlier, and then us leave the field and the tax goes into the tax return like a week later, and then the tax has all these requests for stuff, clients get annoyed. It's like, oh, you guys were just here. Why didn't you just ask for it then? So we try to make sure we're on the same page as much as we can. Are we always on the same page? No, that's not always the case. Uh, when did you get into advisory and consulting? Um, we've had an advisory and consulting practice since I've started. Um, so it's just a matter of, um, the firm's been around since 1919. I started the firm in 2006. There was always an advisory group. Um, to get involved in special projects, you just have to ask. So um, generally, they like to have you get a couple years of like a year or two of audit experience first before you dive into the consulting advisory area. Uh, but it depends, you know, certain things. One of the things that we actually do through our advisory group is the NHL, their collective bargaining agreement requires like, let's say you have, you're at the, you know, the rock and you have the billboards up or the banner ads. The CBA for the players 
basically has like an agreement, let's say it's like 50% of all ad revenue that comes in at the arenas is supposed to go into the pot to pay the players. So one of the things our advisor group does is they do that. They go out to every arena twice a year and they get to they kind of visit and go through the records and make sure like the teams factored in, okay, you took an ad revenue of $10 million, did you put whatever the percentage was in to go into the bucket to pay the players? So having some audit experience is good for that because you kind of know what to look for. Um, but you know, it's different things you get to see. So any other questions? Life at Cone Resident. All right, audit is broken down into industry teams. Kind of talked about that already previously. Um, each team and size is really different. So if you have a client that's really small, you don't need 100 people on it. If you have a client that's really big, you maybe do. Um, so it kind of depends on the fit and need of what's going on with the office and the different engagements. So most of our teams consist of, you never up by yourself. You know, it's like, it, it could be a staff and a manager or it could be like a staff, a senior, another staff, a manager, a senior manager, and a partner. So each client and different engagement based on the risk is different. Um, so it really depends on how many people are on there. So they could last from anywhere as small as like a day or two to you could be on a job for a couple months. So it really depends on A, how good and organized clients are, what the risks are, and kind of time frame. Some clients work best where you start the audit, let's say you're out in the field for like a week and like you're annoying them because they can't do their day job. So you pull out for a week, let them catch up on their day-to-day -day stuff while they get you the rest of the stuff that you need, and you come back a week later. So like the audit might take like span three weeks, but you might only be in the field for two. So you kind of find a happy medium of how to work it with different clients. Uh, Hands-on exposure in the field. We try to work at client locations as much as we possibly can. Um, even on Saturdays in busy season, if they're open, hardly ever are, but um, if you're in the client's face, it's much easier to get results done and you're not distracted in the office. Because when, when I'm in the office, instead of me, if I'm in the client, I'm working on the client 95% of the time. But if I'm in the office, it's like, oh, Jesse's in the office today. I got a question for her on this thing and that thing and that thing. And I have this administrative task I was supposed to do. So it's like you can't focus. So you try to work as much as you can in the field because then you're focused on one client, one responsibility, trying to get that task done. Are you always working just on one thing in the field? No. but. When you're there, it's much easier to work as a team and come up with a game plan to get whatever required testing done. Um, and you do interact with all levels. So partners do come to the field. So partners are ideally in the field twice a week to help review, uh, start start the job and the end of the job. Um, because if like they don't review until like a week after you've left the field and then they find something that you didn't do right, you know, that looks stupid. Um, so our staff wants juggling multiple engagements at one time or is it sort of like it's arranged so that they do one client for one week and then they're off the next week? Generally it's like you're, you're scheduled for like if you're on a job you're scheduled for that job uh, for that week or two weeks or whatever it might be. Um, there could be times where it's like you're at job A for three days and then you go to job B for two days. But most time when you first start off we try to get you scheduled where it's like you're working on one client at a time. Until you get you your feet wet and kind of understand the audit process and how everything works and what we're looking for. Uh, but so generally, we try to start where you're, you're working on one engagement at a time. And you go through your responsibilities and what you're supposed to do, and you're going to move on to job number two or three or four or whatever it's going to be. So. All levels have open door policy. This is true. I do have a door. It's hardly ever shut unless I'm on a conference call. Um, if you have questions, it's much better. Just go ask. Um, I mean, we want you to try to figure things out. You know, we don't want you to ask a question every two seconds. But if you're struggling on something that, like, somebody gives you a, a responsibility to do or a task to do, they tell you, you know, we think this is only going to take you a half hour, and you're 15 minutes in and you're completely lost, ask the question. You know, don't be afraid to ask. There's no stupid questions. I asked a thousand questions every day still. Um, you know, it's like, have you seen this or have you experienced this? Instead of, like, struggling to try to figure it out all by yourself, Ask the question because guaranteed if you have the question, the person that started the year before you probably had the exact same question. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Never be afraid to ask questions. I'll say it a thousand times. All right, what is audit? All right, most of our audits are conducted in GAS standards, uh, generally accepted auditing standards. Um, if you're working on SEC engagements, it could be PCOV standards. 
Um, but most of my client experience, I have a couple SEC clients, but the vast majority of my clients are private companies, so I deal with gas standards. Um, most are pre in prepared in accordance with GAAP. Uh, I do have a couple like one-offs where it's like income tax basis and accounting, stuff like that. But 99% of my clients are GAAP basis. So uh, what you're learning in financial is what you audit in gas. So it's kind of like you combine the best of both worlds. Um, procedures require judgment to determine that financial statements are all fairly stated. So the great thing about audit is like you get to deal with the concept of materiality. So, so we just have to make sure it's like not materially wrong. So it's like you're not trying to necessarily prove like to the penny every single thing. Because if you try to prove every single account to the penny, like you never finish auditing. So um, you have you look at a financial statement and you identify your risk. And if I have a risk area, and most of my risk areas are probably gonna be like related to like revenue recognition, override of controls, stuff with like significant estimates, like that's probably where I'm gonna try to focus my effort on. If the fact that I have a, an insurance policy every year and I have a prepaid balance at the end of the month and it's like a quarter's balance, and analytically it's like it was 10,000 last year and now it's 10,500, I probably don't care. I'm probably not gonna lose a lot of sleep over like the fact that it fluctuated $500. It went from 10,000 last year to like 400,000, I'm probably gonna ask a question. So you gotta like kind of think of like, do the fluctuations make sense? And is it, do I have a risk in this area? If I have a risk, I'm gonna beat it up more if I don't have an identified risk in an area, I'm probably gonna be like, ask the question, get the sporting schedule, make sure it kind of makes sense, and I'm gonna move on. But if it doesn't make sense, even if it's not a risk, I still have to look at it. I can't ignore it. I can't just think, yeah, I went way up, I don't know. But it's not really a risk, so it doesn't matter. Even if it fluctuates, if it fluctuates drastically, even though it's not a risk, maybe your risk assessment was wrong to begin with, and you need to go back and think about that. So. Um, Audits are required for public companies and some private users. Like I said, most of mine are private, um, and most of mine are because of lending capacity. So if a bank offers my client a line of credit or a term loan, you know that you know can give you a line of credit up to thirty million dollars, um, but you know it's gonna last for three years. The bank wants assurance that the numbers that the client's presenting to them on their internal financials are actually in accordance with GAAP. So we're gonna go out and look at the financials and the footnotes to make sure it kind of makes sense. Um, so if you're a bank or you're an underwriter providing credit or providing surety on something, you kind of want to have comfort that what management's telling you is what's actually in accordance with GAAP, and that's what we do. So you don't, you don't want clients saying, oh, revenue's up and cash flows are up and all this other stuff's good without any details, and then you go and look at the details and it's not that way. And then banks are annoyed and then you're annoyed. So, because banks want to get I would too. So. Why do we do what we do? So each industry is different. So who uses the financial statements and why? Uh, what are the risks to Conresic in doing our business and what value do we add? So like I said, most of my client situations, the financial statements for lending purposes. Uh, in construction, it could be for bidding and bonding capacity and surety. So if you know they're trying to bid on a new job and they're trying to get bonding, and bonding is essentially insurance that you're going to finish a job. If you're awarded this job, you're going to finish it. Bonding companies require audited financial statements because they want they're just like a bank. Like if the if the contractor goes bust, the bonding company has to finish it, and they are not contractors. They're insurance company. They don't want to finish the work. They want to make sure like the company that they're insuring can finish it. So you know they're going out and get involved and make sure you have the ability to. You know, have financials. You have cash flows. You have the ability to operate. You know, you're not going to go under tomorrow. We're not going to give you a ten million dollar line of credit. You're going to borrow ten million dollars and go to Mexico and never come back. You know, we want to try to make that work. Um, what are the risks to Cone Resnick in conducting our business? Well, if we do a bad audit and a bank relies on it, or you know, a company comes in and invests or is going to buy this company, and the numbers that were in that statement that we audited are bad, that's not a good look. So um, we, our risk is that we have failed audits or we're not in compliance with auditing standards or we're not doing what we're supposed to do. So it goes from simple things to, as like just standards of letters, engagement letters, uh, independence and communications to like 
you, th you said you audited this and that these numbers were good and they're completely wrong because you missed something. You know, that's the worst case scenario. Um, and what value can we add for our clients? So, like I said, we try to forward think. So if we know there's new revenue recognition standards coming out, they're going to pick private in companies. We've been in communication with all our clients the last couple of years about this already. Because these revenue recognition standards are going to be massive changes. So you can't wait till January 1st, 2019, and just like, oh, I'll think about it now. You know, you need to start thinking about it now. So we're trying to add value by providing insight and knowledge to our clients and, and our industry focus groups now so that people aren't surprised and shocked when it's like all of a sudden, wait, now I have to do what? You know, if we can have that communication up front, or if we're seeing like different things in the industry that like certain clients are doing, because when you work in one industry, you get to see, you get to know a lot about a lot of different clients. They could be doing the exact same thing, but completely different ways. So it's like you have a client that's, you can't like drop trade secrets or anything like that, but it's like if you know, you know, things are trending up, you can ask those questions as part of your audit process. And he's like, you know, I have other clients in this industry that have experienced growth with, you know, millennials or in the multicultural de demographic with a different product mix. Or is that something you're going after? You know, use your knowledge and provide insight and value because if that's something like they didn't consider or think about, maybe they want to think about it, it could lead to a growth opportunity for them. Um, we also try to add value added services. So, you know, if one of my clients is, they're like an engineering firm, um, but they also manufacture stuff and they build these chambers. So it's kind of cool. So if you think of like, um, like a cell phone in your Apple or your Google or your whoever, and you want to test like the ability to send and receive signals at 4G or 5G or 3G or whatever it is, you know, they manufacture these chambers that can send signals at different length and if something's blocking it, does it still get through? So it's as small as something as like a cell phone to as big as planes and missiles and that kind of stuff. So like they have engineers on site uh, as part of their team that test and measure this stuff, it's beyond my knowledge. But um, one of the things that they can do if you're truly servicing your client and thinking of all the opportunities is like there's R&D tax credits. So if you have clients that have specialties and like they have engineers on sites and you have risk of failed things, like if you're an engineering firm, you always have risk that something's not gonna work. It can introduce them to different services that firm might have to offer that could basically pay for our services by getting them credits on their tax return or on you know refunds on their returns or different things. So you try to like add value by getting them what they could be entitled to. But not just, you don't want to just think you're only I'm only an auditor, I only want to think an audit. No, I want to think big picture. How can I assist and help my clients in any way I possibly can? So, how do we do it? Uh, how do we do what we do? Ugh, terrible word. Um, so most financial statements that you're gonna, as an auditor you would see, include a balance sheet, income statement, statement of equity, statement of cash flow, and notes. And you do it all, all through audit programs and various work papers. So, you know, if I have a client that has cash, receivables, and accounts payable, but they don't have debt, like I'm not gonna test debt if they don't have debt. I'm only gonna test cash, accounts receivable, and AP. But if they have debt and they have complex equity, like you have to tailor each approach. And each footnotes, it's important that the numbers are right in the balance sheet, income statement, ca cash flow, statement equity, but it's really important that the notes of the financial statements are also right, so that if a client's notes are wrong, banks think like they're doing something one way, but they're really doing it something else. If you don't check that footnote, and the bank places reliance on that, you basically didn't do your job. So you try to like come up with a game plan at each job, based on each client's operations, and come up with a game plan of like, okay, what's the most efficient and effective way we can do what we're supposed to do, so that we can get in and out of there here, because they have their day jobs to do, but we have our jobs to do, so that we can get them their financial statements and their audit report, so that the bank's happy and everybody's happy. So. If everybody's happy at the end of the day, you did your job. Not everybody's always happy, but <laughs> some people are just miserable. Mm -hmm. Any questions? All right, different career paths at Cone Resnick and even in, you know, just public accounting in general. So different things that firm positions at Cone Resnick, you, start, you can start out as young as an intern or as an associate, uh, eventually get promoted to a senior associate, manager, senior manager, and then the final path if you choose to stay in public accounting would be uh, ideally make it to partner. So at different stages of your career, you do different things. You know, a partner is not doing um, work that an associate's necessarily doing anymore. They're gonna do more higher level things. 
and when you're an associate, <coughs> you're no longer going to thank you. You're no longer going to be doing things like the intern did. Eventually, you're, like, the goal is you're going to progress up the ladder, and as you progress up, you're going to do more different things and more challenging things each time because you're always learning. You always get to learn every step of the promotion ladder that you go up. You learn and get to see different things and experience different things. So some things interns and associates do um, at Cone Resnick. Uh, engagement letters, client information, aggregating it all. Um, you know, if the client sends 50 schedules, and we have a list, like we have, generally we send arrangement letters out and we say we're going to request, you give me support for these 50 things. You know, we want to track them, make sure we got them all. Um, assist and review, preparation of work and checklists, updated work papers, preparing files for lockdowns, travel client locations, assist in the planning. So you really get to touch everything. Um, we try to get you to you start off with stuff that would be, when you first start, probably we're not going to give you like the hardest thing in the world to do. But we're not going to give you just like the easiest stuff either. You know, we want, we're going to start out easier. And by job three, if you know you start week one, you do this. By week two, you know, you did this and then you do something else. And then by week three, it's like you did this, you did this, and you did this. We want you to really start to understand the concept of why. Um, the earlier you understand the concept of why you're doing things, the better auditor, better accountant, better whatever you're going to be. Um, if you don't under, if you just do things to do them because it's like, oh, well, they told me to go put this schedule or tick this thing to this thing, and you don't understand why you're doing it, you're never going to get any value, and you're not going to understand the concept of like why it's important that you're doing it. There's an importance to everything that we do, and the earlier you understand why you're doing it, the better off you're going to be. Um, I think that's probably the number one feedback I would give you guys. Understand why you do things before you just do them. I mean, you have to do things, but you want to understand the concept of why you're doing it. Because if you understand the why, if something is wrong, you'll identify it. If you don't understand why you're doing it, and you just tick something or tie something or do this, but you know something's off a little bit, and you don't understand why that matters, then you're not going to ask the right question of like why that's important. Senior associates, um, in my experience, the hardest level. Um, you become the go-to person. So you're the go-to person from the people below you, the people above you, and management. So management's coming to you uh, because you're the person really running, you're, you're the quarterback, you're the driver, you know, whatever you terminology you want to do. You're in charge of all these different things. This is what you're putting responsibility for. So you know, it becomes like your job. So you want to start it and finish it and get it across the finish line. And, and people come to you from both internally amongst Con Resnick and management, like, I thought I gave you these things, you still have them as open. You know, did, did you not see them or did I not give them to you? So you have to kind of manage different things, um, but it's where you learn the most. And once you get through this, you can pretty much do anything. Um, so you're aggregating the client information again. Um, you're really, you're not necessarily as a senior, you are doing the detailed testing, but it's more important to make sure the people that are working on the team below you are busy if you're sitting there like buried, and then John and Sally are sitting there with nothing to do, you're not doing your job. So you have to make sure that like you're busy, but it's more important to keep the people that are on the team working for you busier. You know, it's like keep them busy, give them stuff to do, and then like when they're doing their testing, then you circle back and kind of come up with a game plan. So I don't know, I'm a morning person, so like I used to like try to come up with my if I could get to the client like 10 minutes before. Um, my team got there, I could come up with my game plan of like, all right, I'm going to have John do this, I'm going to have Megan do this, and that way, while they're doing that, I can circle back and do this. So it becomes that, like, really, organization is really important, and knowing what you're doing and why. Um, so the more organizational skills that you can do and track things, the better off you're going to be. Um, and as a senior, you just really start getting involved more in, like, the financial statement preparation. Um, not that you don't do that as a staff or an associate. Uh, but as a senior, you really got, kind of dive into it more, so you get to see more things. Uh, and one of the fun things you actually get to do is staff evaluations and development as a senior. You know, you, it's really part of your job. As a senior, I would actually say that's probably like your number one responsibility is to assist with staff evaluations and development. Like if, if what, what's your name? Alex. Alex. So if Alex does something wrong on the first job, and nobody tells her she did something wrong. And then she goes to job number two and she does some, that same thing wrong again. 
but nobody tells her. And then she goes to job three, and then finally says, like, somebody says to Alex, like, Alex, this is completely wrong. Like, why didn't you do that? Right. It's like, well, I did the exact same way my first two jobs, and nobody said anything. Like, that's not Alex's fault. That's our fault. Like, you have to develop the people above you to make sure that it makes sense. Like, they understand what they're doing and why. Because um, the earlier you can get the people below you to understand why and do things for you, it makes your job so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It's so important. I can't say it enough. Uh, manager and senior manager. So this is, my involvement now is more high level engagement issues, so I'm not necessarily doing a lot of the detailed testing, but I'm more in the review process and making sure like, you know, with this new auditing standard that came out or the new gap requirement, did we, you know, what we did last year was okay last year, but you know, the rules changed. Did we incorporate that concept into our testing? Are we doing it the right way in accordance with what we're supposed to do? Um, Clearing QC and partner comments, so uh, we'll get to it. Um, but you know, financial statement doesn't just, just show up on my desk and like I authorize it to go out the door and it's good. You know, there's different levels of review process. So when I get review comments from the partner above me or quality control folks above them, um, you know, I help deal with that and get responses and clear comments and make sure we consider anything. Um, one of the other things that you start to do is you know building your relationships and developing your relationships, whether it's networking facilities, networking events, trying to you know, build your own book, um, develop client relationships, offer, just knowing you know, value added services. If a client says, you know, we did this brand new thing this year and I'm really struggling with it. If you know what the firm has to offer through like our advisory group or our tax folks, just bring that opportunity to the partners. Like you know, I was talking to the client and they said they're really struggling with this. Is there something an advisor you can do to help them out with that? You know, just having that knowledge of like asking the right questions, um, that's part of my responsibility. Partners. So partners are the end all be all. They sign, they sign their individual reports. So at the end of the day, like each one of their jobs is their responsibility to make sure like we did everything we're supposed to do. Um, so they're at the highest level of review. So um, they review everything that is a high risk area. So one of the things we talked about earlier, when you have your risk assessments and your risk based things, that like you're going to focus on that. Um, so they're going to really focus on there and higher level technical training staff development of all levels. So just like the seniors are trying to develop um, the associates and the interns below them, you know, the partners really need the development. So like if I want to take that next step and if I'm not doing something right or different, if they want to see me take a different approach on something, like I really rely on the partners to have open and honest communication. It's like, you did this well, Jesse, but next year I want you to try to do this or think about this. Because if I don't, if I don't get that feedback, I'm probably just going to try to do the same thing every time and then I'm not going to grow the way Maybe they're expecting you to grow. All right, audit engagement process. A bunch of different errors and flowcharts, but um, when you think about it, you're, you get hired to do an audit or hired to do something. Um, you, you plan for it. You don't just show up day one and you know, we'll figure it out. Um, the best way to be efficient and effective in everything you do is to plan for it correctly. So you want to know the client, you want to know the industry, you want to have meetings with the client so you understand what happened during the year, what changed. You know, maybe like, you know, the CFO changed during the year. So like the person you've worked with for the past five years is no longer there and they have somebody new in. Well, why did they leave? Uh, was it something like a falling out? Did something bad happen? And is it something that impact? Like, did they hire somebody right away or did they do it like they went for a couple months without anybody really there on oversight? Because then that's a different risk. You know, if all of a sudden you had somebody that was like that oversight person there the whole time, and if they go four months without somebody there, like there's a chance something could slip through the cracks. So like my risk assessment might need to change. So you want to really identify your planning and audit prep and your risk assessment early so that you kind of tailor your audit approach accordingly. So sometimes you go out in the field and something pops up and you can't control that. But if you can control, if you can control 95% of it ahead of the time, you're going to be much better off. So start with planning, audit prep, open items, which is kind of like, our audits, we start with our arrangement letter. So like, if I have a client that has only one operation or I have a client that has like 16 different subs in different locations, like my arrangement letter is gonna be different because not every subsidiary does the exact same thing and not every one is maybe in the same country. So like I have to kind of plan my engagements where it's like, okay, this client's got operations in Europe. So like they're awake five hours before I am. So like if I need something early, I need to get out the night before so that like while I'm asleep, they're working on it. So when I get in, like it's there for me. 
and then they could all have operations in California. They're three hours behind me. So it's like I could probably wait a little bit. I don't have to start on them first thing in the morning. I can do like focus on other things and then plan it out. Um, so you want to kind of have as much review and strategic planning as, as you can. So then as you start the audit, you know, you start the testing and you start review process. Um, so if you're, you're an associate and you're doing your testing, the senior is going to start the review. So the senior starts to check the review, make sure everything is done. Then the manager comes in and does the review on top of that. Or if the senior didn't get a chance to review, the manager starts review right at the associate's work. And then the partner reviews, they put together the financial statement, you send it to QC. Ideally, you get a draft approved from QC. The client checks it, reads it, makes sure they understand and they agree with everything in there. Then you do your update stuff. So, um, I have one that I'm trying, I'm like this close to getting out. I have five audits. Um, and I started in like July, like beginning, middle of June, and like I'm this close. So, I'm, I'm waiting to have a celebratory drink after uh, I finish that one. So, <laughs> so um, different opportunities at Cone Resnick. The 2018 Summer Leadership Program um, is coming up. So, Staying involved with campus and, and, and life, and follow us uh, through social media. Tulsi Patel, she's our she's the lead liaison from our HR and recruitment practice. Uh, her information on this next slide. Um, but you know, follow, follow, stay, just stay involved. You know, work with, work with. Uh, I forget what the department is. What, what do you guys? Career development. Career development. Use them. You guys pay tuition. Use career development. Make them get you interns. Chips. Make them get you interviewed. You know, it's like you guys tuition pays their salary. So I can't. I really use career development to get my job when I work when went to school here. So they're they're there to help you. You know, do interview prep, uh, resume review, work with your professors. You know, attend the career nights and stuff like that. Uh, involvement in this stuff's great. You know, use the school and the resources the school has to better yourself because um, it's so it's nice to like. Be a senior and get a job offer and not have to worry about it um, and have different opportunities that can come up. So use use the career development department to really help you out, but you know use each other too. Um, you know one of the cool things like I'm gonna age myself here, but Facebook was founded when I started when I was in school. So like you guys all grew up with Facebook and LinkedIn and all this different social media <laughs> aspect. Like so Facebook I think came out when I was a junior. At Fairleigh Dickinson University, so like I know a lot of people from school, but like with social media and different things that you guys have nowadays, like you have such a better opportunity to develop relationships for like the long run than than I did. Like I there was like 20-ish people in like my major courses in accounting here. I I stay in touch with probably like five of them because like I didn't I know I mean if I saw them I know them, but like I don't I didn't have that connection. The ability on social media to connect with each other, um, and you never know when like you might you reach out to somebody and somebody might have a different opportunity for you, or you'll be able to toss something your way, or you toss something their way and help each other out. Um, it's one of the great things about social media, so to get advantage of it. So, questions? Any questions on the firm, on auditing, on whatever you guys want to ask? Uh, so, um, what do you have? Uh, Available for uh, twenty or, or twenty nineteen. Like, they do. Uh, it's on. It's on our work with career development because they our HR department fills them in. But I know we do the summer leadership program and we do internship opportunities throughout the time, throughout various stages. Um, so it's just a matter of like getting your resume in with career development, make them get you an internship or an interview opportunity, um, and fall make you know if you. Uh, I think if you don't have this, I'll get Tulsi to send this presentation to to you guys, um, and it has like all our web page and like who to who to reach out to, email, phone numbers, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, be proactive and uh, and just reach out. Um, since you work with a lot of private companies, mm -hmm. do you do you still rotate your partners like every five years or so? Or? Uh, it depends. So some clients no, some yes. So. Um, <laughs> It, I have had partners transition off where it's like, you know, maybe they only had, a, you know, like I said, a lot of our clients are are industry driven. So if like you have a client that has like, they only have one construction client, you know, you probably shouldn't be the partner on it. 
So um, it's kind of stuff like that that makes the transition. We're not private company world. We're not mandatory required yet to rotate off. So um, and a partner doesn't want to give up a book of business if they don't have to. So um, it's part of it. Um, why did you decide to work for a company? Um, I interviewed when I a couple of people that graduated before me um, went big the big four route. Nothing wrong with the big four, but by the time I graduated, I played football. A lot of the guys I played football with were no longer there. So I didn't want to like necessarily feel like I was like just a big number, a number in a big pond. I wanted to kind of feel more involved. Um, and at the time, J.H. Cohen, uh, which it was, was a regional firm where I could see big things and I could see small things and I could kind of get the whole gambit of the experience. So that's the route I chose. I had opportunities with all the big four um, and I, just, I chose a regional firm. That's what felt right for me. Um, I think it's really important for you guys when you're interviewing with different firms and different things and seeing different things, get that cultural feel. Because if you like, feel like you could be happy there, like no one wants to go work and be miserable. So like if, you, if the cultural fit feels right, that's probably where you want to be. That's kind of what it led to. So you started working there in 2006. Yes. So that was only like four years after the whole Enron and like Arthur Anderson thing. Yep. Have you seen like auditing regain like reputation or change? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, I mean, there's surveys out all the time. You know, besides uh, besides doctors, CPAs are the second highest rated profession out there. Um, so yeah, we did take a black eye with the whole Enron thing and Arthur Anderson. But you know, we are constantly trying to change and stay ahead of the curve so that something like that doesn't happen again. Um, that's why our rules change every year. That's why we have great job security because you know every time something could have happened, we change the rule and it requires more testing or different things here and there. So, you know, I think the lawyers are the least rated professionals on like every orange. And I know some great lawyers, so it's just like, you know, lawyers get a bad rap sometimes, but you know, it's always, if you look at like all the surveys out there, it's always like doctors, CPAs, and like these other professionals, and you see like an attorney all the way to the bottom for whatever reason, but there are great attorneys out there, so. Any other questions? About the firm, about the industry, different things you get to see and do. You mentioned uh, sort of people should ask questions and understand why. What other advice can you give like, when you see people maybe in internship positions or first year out of school? Like, what, what have you seen? Um, I think the last couple years, my the number one thing is to understand why. That's always the number one thing. But the number two thing I think would be like, don't be afraid to go up and walk and ask somebody a question. I mean, we're getting like seems like a lot of people anymore like just want to do the email thing. And sometimes if you pick up the phone or you walk over to somebody, like instead of having training like 15 emails back and forth, I can clear it like a minute with one honest conversation. Because like it's hard for me to understand like, if I give you instructions to do something through email and you just respond back via email, it's hard for me to understand that you understand what I, if you really understand what I asked you to do. Um, so a lot of times like if you come to my office, like I'll give you instructions then I'll ask you, do you understand, like, what did I, I asked you to come and tell me what I asked you to do. That way, if you can reiterate it back to me, I know you understand what I wanted you to do. So, um, it kind of helps out. Uh, I think verbal communication and face communication is, is really important. It's so easy in today's day and age. And I, when I started, I was, I was nervous to pick up the phone. It's like, you know, I just graduated. I'm going to call the CFO that's like 56, it's been CFO of this company for, 20 years, knows I'm the new guy, knows like I really don't understand what I'm doing yet, but you gain so much more insight having that verbal conversation or face to face than trying to do it all electronically. So sometimes you have to do it electronically. Like if you're working with a, you know, I'm, if I'm gonna, one, one client has operations in Pennsylvania and operations in Germany and Israel and California, like I'm not in Germany or Israel, California, so like if, and if I can't, I don't speak German, so I can, you know, I'm basically, in trouble there, but if I can't, I can get on the phone with them because they do speak English, but I have to time it right. Um, so, it's one of those things. Any other questions? You really get to see some cool stuff. Um, I think why I like accounting is I don't do the same thing all the time. So, even like in a given week, I could have like three or four jobs going off. Like, I could be two construction clients, but it could be like two completely different construction clients. One could be like an electrician 
and one could be like a heavy highway guy. So you're dealing with like different things all the time. Um, and you get to see different things and experience different things and meet different people. I mean, just the opportunity as like a 22, 23, 24, whatever, how old, old when, you, when you start your career in a firm, um, to get a chance to go up and talk to like an accountant uh, or a controller or a CFO that have all these years of experience, it's really, you get to meet some incredible people and get to learn some incredible things. So, and you get to find things that you like to do. If you don't like things, you're not going to do it. So find, find what makes you happy, find that cultural fit that makes sense for you, and, uh, and kind of keep it going. So and don't be afraid to ask questions, because I do it every day. So. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for having me. Use your